Welcome. Uh, my name is Rebecca Riley. I'm director of the ESCO, and this is an interview for the ESCO Economic Measurement Conference 2021. And we're delighted to have, us, have with us Professor Sir Richard Blundell, who has just delivered a keynote talk on wage progression of low skilled workers and the role that occupation and types of firm play in this. So Richard, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it was a very inspiring talk. Uh, you highlighted that um, jobs are not always enough to support individuals and that um, we need to, in, in labor market policy and skills policy, we need to understand uh, the factors underlying wage progression if we want to help uh, low skilled individuals improve their economic circumstances uh, and to address inequality more generally. Um, you highlighted the importance of soft skills in this context and uh, suggested that policy should consider these, how they're measured, remunerated, and also advanced. Um, would you be able to expand on the key messages you see for policymakers, uh, also in the context of um, the leveling up agenda that we were, we were talking about earlier, it's so important for policy going forward. And um, perhaps I could also ask you to elaborate on the issues that you see arising for wage progression and inequality more generally with the pandemic and also in the aftermath of the pandemic. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rebecca. It's great to be here. Fantastic to uh, give the talk, actually. Um, made me think more about the, the area. And I, I should, to begin with, uh, thank uh, not just ESCO, but the ONS and the ADR for uh, for, for helping access the data over this period, actually, which has really allowed us to advance the research on this uh, question of wage progression and the kind of skills and the kind of firms that are that deliver the best um, the best wage progression for uh, for lower lower skilled lower educated workers. I think this has become uh, a really key point. Uh, in the UK, but not just in the UK. Um, we've had fairly buoyant, uh, at least before the pandemic, we had fairly buoyant employment and employment growth, um, even among uh, lower educated workers. Uh, but unfortunately, the level of wages, and in particular, as I emphasized here, wage progression has not been good. And um, what this means is that uh, there are the two main policies in this area of minimum wages and universal credit uh, are leaned on a lot and they're very important, uh, but they're kind of cross-section policies, I kind of think of them. They deal with the problem as you see it at the time. And what's happened is that um, rather than um, universal credit encouraging people into work, which it certainly can do, it has uh, incentives to work in it, uh, but it doesn't have incentives for wage progression. And what happens is people can easily get stuck in low wage jobs and uh, and minimum wages, of course, can prop up the wage, but it doesn't prop up wage progression. So you can be stuck and we're seeing this increasingly that um, that lower, you know, in a way, not people who didn't go to university and don't have good uh, academic qualifications get stuck in rather poor jobs. And uh, these are often concentrated, I should add, in areas where the leveling up agenda is particularly acute. So I think they, uh, they speak to, this speaks to all of these uh, issues. It also speaks to what's going to happen as we come out the pandemic, because this issue is particularly important for the young and wage progression and uh, and wages, in fact, of, of younger generations have, uh, have, have not held up well so it's really the focus i think at least at the bottom end of uh, the labor market but it, it this involves a lot of a, a large fraction of the labor market and it's very important so what we know is that we've documented this wage progression problem and we now know that just getting people into work isn't enough it's the type of work and the type of firm and the type of skills they have that matters it's just how do we dig into that? And uh, the great thing about um, the uh, bigger data sets, um, the data sets like ASHI and uh, BIRD and the ARD that we 
use here is that it, they're big enough and detailed enough that we can really dig into this. They still have drawbacks, so, you know, the frontier of, of data that's invaluable for understanding and for policy. We're still, we're still pushing that frontier back. And uh, the great thing about ESCO is that it's really helping with that. Um, and what we, what we found uh, was that once we look at what tasks, what occupations, which we can do with that data, people are doing, we found that there are certain uh, types of certain workers with certain, doing certain occupations with certain firms that seem to do rather better than others. So the question is, is that a systematic thing or is it just random? You know, if it's systematic, that means we can work on it, learn about it, and maybe help others uh, to achieve that wage progression. And we did find it was uh, systematic. What we found it was systematically in occupations where tasks involve soft skills. Uh, that is skills which uh, make you um, valuable at your ability to interact with people, to be uh, perceptive, uh, to be reliable, but not just those reliability things, literally uh, to work with others, to communicate, not necessarily to do cognitive things uh, and to solve problems themselves, but to be aware of problems and to point them out when they're occurring. And these are what we call complementary skills. They're very valuable to school. They don't get outsourced. People doing this don't get outsourced because they're valuable to the core of a firm. And we found they're particularly valuable in firms that have higher educated workers as well. So kind of workers with a balance, firms with a balance of types of workers, not just low wage firms and low wage workers and work and firms that are on the more on the technological frontier, the R&D firms. And so policy needs to work on skills, but it also needs to combine those with the type of firms. And I, I think this got a lot you know, a lot to, we have a lot to uh, learn and to, uh, to uh, put into the policy agenda. And if you think about uh, uh, the policy agenda of leavening up, one issue that we have in the UK, perhaps we have it rather more than many other, at least European countries, is that certain areas are, are rather devoid of educated, young educated workers. You know, what a feature of the UK geographically is that some areas, as we have increased the number doing higher education, those higher education workers tend to cluster in what we might call uh, larger thriving cities, thriving areas, and leave behind towns and cities that are, that are uh, the left behind. And, and of course, if you don't have a set of educated workers, in a town, it's very hard to attract good firms. And so this makes the policy issues, you know, much bigger. And, uh, and, and I think people are aware of this, you know, th this is a tipping point type of problem. You need to change the environment. We've known that, you know, if you can situate a university somewhere, that, that place often does rather well. And it's not unrelated to these two issues of technology and, uh, a larger share of educated workers. So I think we're, you know, there's something coming up here that's, uh, that's really important. And uh, this data is wonderful because it's, it's big. It's only 1%, but you know, that's, that's, you can learn a lot from that. And we can track travel to work areas. So we can look at different areas and we can see, you know, where this matters and for what type of workers. So I've become, you know, um, uh, starting out rather depressed about what was happening at the bottom of the labor market, but getting a bit more optimistic that at least we're discovering where things can work. And uh, maybe that gives us some, uh, some room for a policy maneuver. Thank you. So it sounds, it sounds like the policy levers needed to address these issues are quite broad ranging. Uh, and require some form of coordination. Yeah, that's um, right. And so I guess, um, given what you say also, I mean, we have a new skills and productivity board advising the Department for Education on, mm -hmm. on, on exactly these types of issues related to skills and productivity. So 
I was wondering whether you wanted to say more about um, how we should think about the implications of your findings for productivity. Uh, of course, we have a, a, a productivity slowdown in the UK, which is probably more accentuated than elsewhere. Um, so I wondered whether you could comment on that. Yeah, we do. I, in a way, the big, big problem for the UK economy has been the productivity slowdown. We know that. By the way, that you know that's fairly important across the distribution. It, it's affecting everyone, and uh, it's you know understanding that is is really, really key. And uh, I think what we're looking at here is that particularly the impact that has on the growth of wages for for the lower educated and what what can work for them, which perhaps is the most important in a way, at least from the inequality and leveling up agenda, it must must be. I think the point here, you know, it's kind of easy to say, oh, well, it's this type of firm and this type of skills that match together that give you something. The question is, how do you make it work? How do you kind of scale that observation? up and um, there's a kind of couple of points there one is um, we do have this problem of education flight the way I like to think of it you know areas where the educated have left and uh, we do need to address that I think that is that is important so even if you're trying to deal with um, you know lower educated low wages you need to think about the the way the whole economy is working but then when you look at the skills I should add cognitive skills, you know, they're first order importance. They always are important. Um, but what we are finding is these soft skills are also important and we're very poor at uh, training and accrediting them. So what we find is that it takes a while for a worker to kind of get the return from that. And they can't really take it with them because, you know, I can say I'm a really great worker working with other people um, you know, uh, reliable, being able to spot problems when they occur. But that's just my word. And if I go to another employer, you know, how do I convince them of that? And that's why I think we need to think about the accreditation of those kind of skills. There is work going on in that, by the way, including by great companies like Google, that, you know, there are plenty of people aware that there's these skills that are important that are not very well accredited in our regular vocational education system. So the edu vocational education system certainly needs a lot of improving and there's obviously a huge amount of effort going into that right now. Uh, but I think the set of skills, we still need to think about what, what's going to be important. And uh, I get, you know, my view would be this is just going to be even more important in the coming year or two as we come out the pandemic. Yeah, great. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to just uh, move a little bit away from from um, the talk you just gave, uh, because you're also involved with um, the IFS Deaton review on inequality, uh, and as I understand it, this is looking at uh, documenting many different dimensions of inequality. Um, so, I was interested uh, in your views on. Um, the fundamental drivers of inequality in the UK more generally and which dimensions you see as most important to address uh, in the near term. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this is a wonderful project I'm involved in and we have the, the great uh, Angus Deaton uh, uh, in the chair, but many other wonderful people, philosophers, sociologists, epidemiologists, and, uh, you know, many different uh, experts and from around the world by the way uh jean Tirole, the you know the leading nobel prize winner uh french nobel prize winner uh, is on the panel too and i point to him because you know I, you wouldn't think necessarily what why have someone who's famous for looking at, at markets and competition and all those and why have someone like angus who's famous for looking at health and health inequalities and the answer is that all these things matter you know, and, uh, you know, you might think competition policy doesn't have a, a key role in, in inequality, but I, I assure you it does. You know, the idea of the way companies operate and they're, uh, they're not just operating in what we call the product market, you know, goods and things, but also in the labor market, just think of the debate over Amazon workers and other, other firms. So, 
the role of um, the role of firms and and activity, not just in skills, but in the way they operate in the market, is important. And uh, and so that's one aspect that requires a lot of a lot of different inputs. Um, and we're, we're you know remember when we set this up, Angus says. Uh, you know, I just want to get away from genies and top 1% and all that, you know, they're there and we know that, but let's get behind it, you know, let's get underneath it and see how it works. And so what we ended up doing is, is commissioning kind of 19 areas of work, you know, from health from political economy, from philosophy of what, 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 what is it about inequality that concerns people, uh, attitudes to inequality, gender, gender inequality, in the role of immigration, the role of geography, place, uh, the role of education, even early years, you know, we know that possibly the place you should really work is, you know, with families and early years and, mm -hmm. and how those all come together. So it's not just, you know, taxes, incomes and the labor market, uh, that's important, but there's this whole uh, set and I guess when it comes together, you know, take uh, take the interaction of uh, health and the labor market. So if people are really, um, you know, having a poor outcome in the labor market and also either causally or just happening together, they're having poor outcomes in health as well, be it mental health, which has obviously been important recently, even more important recently, but, but otherwise, you know, health outcomes that make working and social interactions hard you know so the idea is to is to not silo these things but to bring them together see if we can come up with with uh both an understanding and policies that uh, that can kind of develop from these interactions i think it's unique in that sense the, the sense that we're trying to look at all these things and the way they come come to, together and i that's that's been um you know that's been uh, exciting sometimes a bit depressing because they do accumulate you know you do find you know if you if you bring together the the labor market families you know problems in families health problems you know you of course we know education um, uh, 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 education poor outcomes in education those things tend to uh, unfortunately uh, come together so again a kind of holistic view and then hopefully a uh, holistic policy to come out of it um yeah when the pandemic came along we were kind of sitting around saying oh maybe we should just stop the review for a while because this is not going to be important inequality won't be important it won't be top of the agenda you know uh but of course exactly the opposite it's become more or less the key the key thing to worry about after the pandemic because the pandemic's just done so much to increase inequalities um it, perhaps it introduce a few new ones as well of course as we know from the amount of space you've got in your house now really matters and uh, open space really matters perhaps even more than it it, it, it used used to access to digital uh, digital online learning all those things matter just so much more than they uh, probably even more than they did before so um, yeah it's uh, it's a really exciting project I mean, we based it at IFS, but it's much bigger than, you know, we don't, this is not an IFS thing alone. Um, we've tried to bring in colleagues, of course, around the UK, colleagues from everywhere, LSE, um, Manchester, right, right across the board, who, whoever are the experts, the right people, but broader than that from around the rest of Europe and North America as well. So um, thank goodness for these, uh, for, for these video meetings because we've been able to run them uh, every month with everybody uh, fairly efficiently even with people coming in from america and from uh, finland and from uh, around around europe uh, so that's um, that's been a you know perhaps a, made things a little bit easier actually well, we'll look forward to the findings of, of, of that review, uh, very much so uh, if i can just finish off here with um, as this is a conference on measurement uh, if I can just um, bring us back to the data a bit, I mean, um, you know, there, there are challenges in measuring inequality, uh, even the standard metrics that you're describing before, the top 1%, the genie, et cetera. 
Um, in your talk, you highlighted that you're using the quality lead data, linked employer employee data. But of course, we know that the ASHI is a 1% sample of, of workers in, in any given firm. Yeah. Um, in some countries, like the Scandinavian countries, I think you highlighted Norway in your talk as well, actually. They've got a, a much uh, more of a sort of census of, of workers and firms linked together uh, and, and other things are possible with those data. I mean, what, what would you see as the key data gaps um, we have in the UK for addressing issues around inequality, labor market performance, productivity? Um, and um, where do you see benefits, for example, of using novel data sources? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, measurements become a really exciting and important area. So, you know, it's it's not the kind of uh, bit at the bottom of our analysis or any analysis. Now it's right there at the top, whether it be methods or, you know, access. And there are some leading, leading cases. So Scandinavia has been particularly exciting in terms of where it's been going in terms of data access and what it allows us to do. And we basically got the whole of Norway, uh, including everybody in it as a kind of experiment, really. Um, and that's that's very exciting, uh, but it doesn't help address, particularly address the UK or other countries. Uh, uh, every country has a rather different form of its data, partly just because that, you know, they're different countries. Um, you know, the fact that we have such a large service sector and we have rather precarious and uh, and unusual jobs um, so the self-employment makes some of these measurements just in 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 the kind of labor market difficult uh, as as you mentioned I think we my view still is that we have the data really uh, we have much more data than we're uh, uh, than we have been able to use yet so esco and the uh, ONS and the way this linking to, to give you an example I mentioned this that one is the link to the census you know the census link will allow us to do some of the things you mentioned because we'll have the whole population we'll be able to look at what uh, many of the things that are measured there uh, not just location and stuff but you know education backgrounds the kind of family structure all missing from ASHI and that, that's a problem. And uh, so linking with several censuses, and this is already underway, actually, there's experimentation going on on this, and I'm hoping we'll be able to access that. Also with um, with two other really key data sets. One is the, is the detailed HMRC data that really tell us, you know, in real time what's happening in the economy, both in the business part of the economy and in the worker part of the economy that would be uh, valuable it's sitting there and we we can do this and that's happening and then thirdly on health um you know we have a vast we have a very connected health system with um with uh you know a lot of detail that's been very effective in the pandemic we know that we're probably the most joined up health system in, in possibly in the world and that's meant that we can do the things we've been doing much more effectively through the NHS, but linkages on data, it had been much harder there, there. But that, of course, would tell us a huge amount as well about the kind of health capital that people are building up, the problems that are that are coming along alongside um, their incomes and employment. So I think it's we do have the data there, and it's really uh, pushing the access. Um, making sure people have the full trust that we're we're trustworthy using data. There are ways of making it confidential without making it unusable. And uh, and that's, you know, that's what we're we're try trying to do. And uh, one thing that's happened in the pandemic is, you know, that's the frontier of that has really uh, been pushed very nicely. And Owen has been behind that because we've been able to think of ways of retaining confidentiality but accessing from more sites so that we can do research in a in a uh, clever way uh, without um, without uh, 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 worrying without you, you know uh, upsetting the confidentiality side of it so that that's 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 been really key but also you know the fact that we've had to think in real time as the pandemic has evolved, you know, bringing in new surveys, linking them up, and 
you know, has been really key. So the real time data in the HMRC is just, you know, huge and valuable. And those kind, you know, it's not just that, but there's there's data like that. So I think it's sitting there. I think the pandemic has shown we can do it in a trustworthy way. Um, and uh, so maybe there will be more confidence in science and social science using these data sets uh, in a way that's quite common actually in Scandinavia. You know, you you would sit down and be, uh, it's not, you know, there's confidentiality things you have to go through, but it's more common to be making these linkages and learning from them. And uh, as I said today, there are things that, you know, you really can learn. It's not just about understanding behavior, it's about getting, uh, policy right as as well so yeah I'm, I'm quite excited about that and and you know quite positive about what's been happening with data access and linkages in the uk uh, but you know as i made clear in the talk you know like currently we do have limitations and you have to be a bit careful drawing too much from what you know you have to learn from what you have but uh, be a little cautious in uh, drawing too much from it, given um, given you know the one percent in Ashi and the the other variety of things that are that are obviously somewhat limitations in the UK. So um, a call for for better access and cont yeah. continuing the the developments we've had over the last year in in terms of data sharing. Um, I think so very it's very exciting and i think we've shown that we can we can deliver on it we can deliver you know important information for government uh, and for society not just government for society at large and for pushing research frontiers you know we could, the methodology that's been developed is you know is that's very long lasting methodology shouldn't be underestimated we've always been uh, at the frontier of methodological developments in the economic statistics in the UK. And um, we need to stay there, we are. And, you know, we're probably some of the most cited work in economic statistics in the world has been developed in the UK and uh, over many years. And it's good to make sure we're, we're staying at the frontier there. It means that we're doing excellent analysis as well as um, uh, as well as policy work. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for your talk and for your thoughts. Um, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Thanks.